is for good people to do something. All that is needed is for good people to do something. All that is needed is for good people to do something. All that is needed is for good people to do something. All that is needed is for good people to do something. All that is needed is for good people to do something. Hey folks, one of the most popular dumb ideas of our age is that being angry shows you take something seriously. That simply isn't so. The way we really show we care about something is by getting over ourselves on its behalf proving that the point and the principle are far more important than our own personal emotional reactions. Don't get me wrong here. There are a lot of real things we could be angry about right now. Massive injustices and ongoing practical irresponsibilities so vast and mindless it is measurably reducing this planet's ability to sustain life, leading us toward a tragedy of a scale and a horror which no previous human acts, including every war in history, could possibly approach. Many don't like to think about this stuff, which is entirely understandable. It is frightening to be aware of this crisis. Very stressful stuff. But for some, the kind of Earth we leave for future humans, and the kind we are offering those starting out, who we just now invited to the party, is the most important question of all. A deadly emergency being ignored, except for a few trivial feel-good rituals. To be very clear, recycling will not do it. Perfect recycling of every single material we use would still only fix 3% of our environmental overshoot. We won't be making orbital solar blankets to regulate climate with a Bluetooth app, either. The scale and complexity of the disruptions we've caused is now beyond our ability to fully understand, let far alone control. So, yes, this is an objectively, even a materially infuriating time. By that I mean... We can now correctly say that our common ideas about matter itself are bonkers, self-destructive, imbalanced. But it is also fair to say that most of the crazy, dangerous, unjust things that bug us have been going on a while, even if their effects have never been quite so complex or so undermining to psyche, soul, and the earth itself. One of the most unsettling features of modern life for individuals is the rate of change. It is no longer realistic to assume that anything which has worked in the past will continue to work into the indefinite future. Rather, it's a much safer bet that what we do for a living and how we live with whatever we get for our efforts will be almost unrecognizably different much sooner than we think or are prepared for. Now, humans are the kind of mammals that find some novelty stimulating. Culture itself depends upon this, the fancy stuff and the lowbrow equally. But we are way past saturation now, drowning instead, mostly in weak, watery tea. The way the quantity of information has multiplied and the specific power per work encountered diluted feels like it is related, though there is still tons of great new stuff coming out. This ain't a fogey riff about how nothing new has been any good since my own generation burned out a quarter century ago. Still, finding brilliant and transformative work that changes lives among the vast pile of mediocre micro-flavors pitched to suit every style and mood has never been so difficult. My point here is that we are all bothered, often for fair and objective reasons, and we're also overloaded with information, as well as being overprodded emotionally by advertising and its many more political cousins. 
What does still excite us, even in this dulling media deluge? Ideas which express our own frustrations. We can just sit back and root for someone who feels our favorite fury out loud, and then go on about our day refreshed, because we know this famous face would not be allowed to publicly represent that view if there were not a whole tribe out there who agreed with them and with us. Even though we can't see our howling pack, we are emotionally reassured that we have one and are a part of it. Then again, that analogy is kind of insulting to wolves, because they have rather good discernment in many areas where large groups of humans tend to go badly wrong quite often. It's even possible that truth and lies might always be judged better by scent than words. Worth a thesis study, anyhow. You ever hear of Godwin's Law? Since all internet arguments tend to get increasingly extreme, there are a limited number of steps before someone inevitably invokes the Nazis. Therefore, whoever goes there first shall be deemed to automatically have lost the argument, even if a Nazi analogy is the most useful and accurate fit. Now, <laughs> I gotta tell you first, I find it hilarious that 27 years after first creating this law, that same thoughtful fellow Godwin repealed it with these words. By all means, compare these shitheads to Nazis again and again. I'm with you. But just to respect established rules of electronic civility, let us say there is in fact an excellent reason that certain periods of cultural thought even from advanced, powerful, and undoubtedly clever cultures are not considered seriously when we seek valuable ideas about morality. I really don't want to hurt anyone's feelings here, but we moderns are all living in that kind of a culture right now. Yes, as I've already said, there's a lot of truly infuriating stuff going on. But the way our big arguments are constructed is so tricky that both sides are pretty much always wrong about pretty much everything. Not in terms of their good intentions. It's important to make this distinction. But because the ideas are oversimplified to the point where they create new problems and even new victims with their passionate demands that others be required to change, by those institutions powerful enough to compel them. Those very same institutions which have always and forever been key to enforcing state will against freedom seekers on every side, depth, and even altitude of every social question. Now, I've called myself a lot of things over the years, politically, psychologically, culturally, but I can't think of any description I can now use which will reliably deliver an accurate message. So here it is simply. I hate people being silenced, shut up, ostracized, made to feel unwelcome, small, unworthy, or ashamed. Prideful unkindness is what makes me most angry. Unfortunately, if you start looking at a root that fundamental, you never stop finding new victims of unkindness and lies designed to shut them up. Corporations absolutely do some truly lousy things, but individual people make selfish, stupid, unkind choices also, usually for much more arbitrary and unproductive reasons. <coughs> Both of these can also do useful work that benefits others when they are steered by an ever-adapting balance of compassion and reason. To say that a limited number of corporations do a large part of the ecological damage, or even the economic damage which is being done to the earth, is to dishonestly pretend that we don't know who their ultimate clients actually are. Here's a hint if you're still wondering. Check in the bathroom mirror tomorrow morning. Now, in the West, our combination treadmill, media circus, and mass production rewards festival, the whole post-war prosperity consumerist religion, which is what it really is, 
still feels like a fairly complete life experience for most. But it's worth remembering that many of the things humans have long treasured are now being squeezed right out of our lives, especially when we're feeling incredibly miserable and wondering why. Efficiency, catharsis, and amusement level are not always great standards for getting the nutrition our brains and hearts require to stay strong, flexible, and effective in such speedy and uncertain times. Now, let me start being troublesome right here at home and then work outward a bit from there. Smug Canadians are especially fond of pointing out popular American sins we deplore the worst of their racism and generalize it sneeringly, even where much progress has been made. But our indigenous First Nations people do not even have the right to safe water yet. And despite more than a century of direct and grotesquely racist attacks on their culture through forced removal of their children, we continue to interfere to an extent some international bodies consider cultural genocide. Not only that, we have our own deep racism problems, even in those enlightened area, urban centers which most like to lecture others. And these aren't reduced one bit by outrage, not toward newcomers or toward free and open public debate. There are a lot of comfortable homeowners who say there can never be any discussion about immigration levels at all, which is not fundamentally racist. A very easy position to take when your accommodations aren't becoming desperately scarce and unaffordable, and instead your investment values are steadily increasing. But only if we were actively constructed massive, that is to say adequate, new rental housing projects, without incurring huge legacy costs to the public purse, could we have a fair clear, and entirely objective discussion about numbers and their economic and cultural effects without also casually saying, screw the rights of the poor and the working class whenever we do so. Now, this sounds cliche, but my best friends and my favorite Canadians are all newcomers. Most of them arrived inside this new century. And like me, they deserve a fair, stable, and adequate playing field, even at the bottom, upon which to build new lives and hope. I had one dear friend who came from Central Africa, where his family were the traditional chiefs of a populous village. One day, one of the new kids in the department asked him outright, Okay, so if you're a chief back there... What are you doing here, slaving away for crappy wages that don't even pay your bills, while everyone back home expects constant presents and favors from you? He answered very directly. He said, I was lied to by the Canadian immigration officials back home. <laughs> I'm serious about this, too. When you look from afar at the potential best-case rewards, we still seem a land of easy wealth and advancement. But the true costs of life here, even at the bottom of the working class, are never made clear to newcomers before they arrive, burdened already with the expectations of those back home who remain ignorant and demanding, even when the newcomer begins to learn disappointment awfully fast. The side of an argument that makes us angry or gets us excited, is still connected to the rest of the world, which includes all of those sides of it we don't find as interesting or can't stand to think about at all. Did Hillary lose the election because she was a woman? Doesn't anybody remember the 90s? The Clintons governed as aw shucks, Reaganites, never once on the side of the poor, economically merciless, deregulating corporate sellouts. They also advanced the Albright Doctrine, a whole catalog of new reasons for Democrats to call upon the army and its hyper-profitable corporate weaponry to kill foreigners on so-called moral grounds. We know for sure that Hillary maintained this profoundly racist thinking under Obama because she was key to the disastrous military invention in Libya. 
once a country where women could be doctors, lawyers, and professors, where now many can't even leave the house without fear for their lives. With the national government and economy smashed to bits, the vast arsenal that Gaddafi assembled was rapidly distributed to minority and nomadic peoples of North Africa, who have an ancient tradition of conflict with those settled on the coast and the richer crop-bearing plains, and are now being tracked and actively targeted by flying killer robots sent from a rich country which cannot even conceive of their way of life or thinking, but does often and easily label those they deem uncompliant or troublesome terrorists, killable in quantity without any qualm or question. Seriously, Hillary lost because she was a shit candidate. Attempts to say it was all about Russia or grotesque sexism completely ignore the fact that she represented long-standing war crimes, racist incarceration on a scale that would make Stalin blush, betrayal of the poor and cynical corporate domination of the economy, and all of its key regulations and governing laws. Principled leftism may be harder to define than it once was, but it is absolutely none of those things. Whether the other guy was worse in every conceivable way is a whole different question. But I'm convinced we'd learn more of practical value, especially right now, if we asked, how was it that they chose a candidate so lousy that they could lose to a guy who clearly didn't even want the job, but just thought it would be fun to use the bully pulpit for a while? I know this will make some of my American friends mad, but Russia is not your problem. Did they screw with your heads a bunch? Why, yes they did, and they had a grand time doing it. You know why? Because America has been screwing with Russia for a full century without any pause or moral restraint. As the USSR came apart, remember, proud Russia was promised that NATO would not ever expand eastward. Bill Clinton screwed up the peace that should have followed the end of the Cold War by breaking that promise for domestic political advantage and for those hyper-profitable weapons sales, and soon began installing advanced mil American military hardware frighteningly close to their strategic heartland. Believe me, if the U.S. saw that much Russian war gear in Central America, you can bet they would freak out very badly indeed, just as they did during the Cuban Missile Crisis, during which the Democrats' great idealized hero, Kennedy, first invented the crazy mofo strategy, which many Democrats later blamed on Kissinger and Nixon. Was Putin's use, political use of the war in Chechnya scary? Yes, it absolutely was. But the scale of damage from the American invasions in the Middle East, which span this whole century and continue even today, is incomparably greater, more disruptive, and more tragic. Strangely, the one country which has suffered no damage at all from American involvement in the Middle East over the last two decades is the only one that definitely was involved in attacking them. A majority of the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia, as did most of the logistical support. No one has shown a legally clear connection to the crown, but there was definitely plenty of private Saudi money involved. Afghanistan was blamed and even attacked because they asked the American government for some evidence of bin Laden's guilt before they would extradite him. A Saudi himself, remember, but to them, also a guest with his own human rights, to the U.S. for trial. And also for hosting what the CIA insisted were two training camps for the 911 terrorists. Problem with that is, one of those camps was actually being used by Pakistani intelligence, ISI, which was allied with CIA, to train infiltrators for Kashmir. And another, long abandoned, had been used by the CIA itself during the Mujahideen days to train Uyghurs to give the Chinese their own internal terrorist fits. I really wish I was kidding on this stuff. But seriously, you gotta look up some history. 
Just as with Saddam's terrif terrifying arsenal on the eve of Desert Storm, all they really did was check the receipt. What did we sell them or set up there recently? Then they announced that those very items were the terrifying threat that badly needed to be bombed. And right away or else. The only places we are legally certain significant planning and training were done are in Germany and in the U.S. itself, neither of which made appealing or profitable bombing targets. Too many reporters who could speak our language and would understand what any ruined landscape was supposed to look like. The point here is, if someone can undermine your democracy with a snarky pamphleting campaign, you have much bigger problems than pamphlets. Canada is no less blind with our racial hypocrisies and our massive international mining damage to the poor and ind indigenous communities all around the world. Also, about the way that newcomers are lied to, tricked, and then pitted against struggling locals, instead of everyone being given a proper, dignified ground upon which to build the life we so sweetly claim to offer all. Now, looking even further, Europe is tearing itself apart in no less interesting ways. Brexit is, I'll admit, especially loud and weird, but we really shouldn't forget the way the German banking model destroyed the Greek economy and could not be stopped by any coalition of humanists, rational objectors, or other non-insane people. Even when the Greeks elected radical leftists with a mandate specifically to repeal this foreign theft of treasure and autonomy, that government was ultimately strong-armed into selling them out. Democracy itself overruled in favor of investor finance, devastating the future of an entire generation in the country which just happened to invent most of what we all call democracy and loudly pretend to hold sacred above all other political ideals. It's very easy to sneeringly suggest that those who want to break from the EU are all racists and throwback nationalists, but there are actually excellent reasons to object to being governed by a group capable of that sort of massive and really unconscionable evil. You ever hear of Noam Chomsky? He's a great hero to many on the left, and I'm really fond of his clarity, courage, and scholarship myself. He often discusses true things that others are afraid to even mention. But I was struck by a comment he made in a famous movie-length documentary about sports being just a tool of state propaganda and indoctrination. <coughs> I actually found myself nodding and agreeing with him at first, then I sat back and caught myself. But wait a minute, I don't really like sports, and I know almost nothing about them. When I thought about the comment a little harder, I realized this dismissive attitude is key to how we all simplify and misunderstand things so comfortably and not only feel like we are more like the rest of our entirely imaginary but emotionally convincing cultural tribe, but also imagine a fearsome and evil tribe of others, which our tribe must be fierce, or at least loud and simplistic, in order to defeat. People who don't like comic books have been saying they are evil since the 1950s, and that they will definitely corrupt the minds of innocent youth, and then go on to destroy civilization at large. But as a guy who's read quite a few comic books, I know for a fact that there are many superb humanist messages which were created for comics, then later made the jump to mainstream culture through film. Even the most overtly ridiculous superhero stuff, which is so gleefully demolished by a wonderful variety of critical theories, has far more of political, philosophical, and cultural merit than the ignorant ever realize or admit. Believe it or not, I first heard Shelley's brilliant poem Ozymandias from the mouth of the robot Ultron in the final page of his battle with the Avengers. Trust me, the poem, which I have since memorized, suffers not at all for that wacky introduction. 
People who don't like horror movies, rap music, or rock, think them damaging and dehumanizing to those who do like them. The same goes for people who don't like video games. This assertion always starts with a reduction of the person who sees greater merit or pleasure there, a full dismissal of their intelligence, taste, and entrained passion. No fair! If you want to tell me the ink in my comic book came from the poisoning of a village, or the server which updates my video game has an irresponsible ecological footprint, we can then discuss clear, actual properties, rather than celebrating our contempt for things we don't much care for. But let's be honest here. We'll almost certainly be communicating these ideas about our sneering displeasure on devices made from conflict minerals using power which disturbs the environment. Or at very least, a farmer who hates wind farms. Again, what is on the far side of the aspect of the thing we most enjoy looking at? Thinking about farmers is actually a good way of remembering this practical, full-picture approach. A hobby gardener can play and even work with opinion all day long, concentrating on the things they enjoy doing most and ignoring the rest. But a food farmer has to deal with all of the realities of growing things in order to bring in a crop, not just whatever parts seem ideal or pleasant. Back to the drawing board for them usually means bankruptcy. While I'm on it, even vastly unpopular ideas like genetically modified organisms aren't morally simple. Seriously, and I'm not just talking about the top-level question, about feeding the ever-increasing poor of the world with high-yield industrial cereal crops, as important as that point is all on its own. You know the Holy Grail? The top goal of all GMO research around the world? They call it nitrogen fixing. Yes, you remember your science, right? There is indeed plenty of nitrogen gas in the atmosphere around us. But most plants have to take the nitrogen they need from solid but soluble compounds in the soil, what we usually call fertilizer. Dangerous stuff in terms of mining and industrial manufacture, distribution, runoff, and soil exhaustion, and also, not incidentally, a key component in powerful low-cost explosive recipes favored by domestic terrorists. A small range of naturally occurring plants do have the ability to extract all of the nitrogen they need to grow directly from the air around them. We say they can fix their own nitrogen. They require no fertilizer ever. Personally, I think governments ought to restrain corporations from modifications to life forms intended only to maximize corporate profit. Terminator crops, which grow to full maturity without producing viable seeds to be replanted the way their natural equivalents do, are a great example of such an evil-minded alteration. Food is much too important to let greedy speculators play with it so recklessly. The most important strategic necessity of all, if we think about it. But if we cease all genetic modification research before creating adaptable and thermally tolerant cereal crops which can fix their own nitrogen, billions of poor people will surely starve to death as the planet steadily heats and the organic pollution of rivers and oceans, already at a crisis by fertilizer and pesticide runoff, will only accelerate. Simplistic answers are wrong answers. A sign that people are being dismissed, written off, erased. Don't even start down that road unless you have a convincing set of ideas about how to pick which millions should starve to death first. And also a persuasive way to explain to those people why they ought to do that in order to justify your great ideas and strong feelings. Personally, I say 
Erase instead my bias, my sanctimony, and my ignorance. Again and again, please. Ignorant and angry certainty is not a tool that builds, heals, or shares. It is a weapon we use to attack, silence, and oppress, and feel great about ourselves even as we add more fuel, fury, and ego to the already frightening bonfire. As for my friend the chief, he learned a lot here, and his kids had a great education and made many friends. But you know what? In the end, there was more opportunity for him in one of the poorest countries in the entire world. So we went back home again to stay. Have a feeling he'll also be warning the next guy. Don't just get excited about the upside. Add up all the costs as well. Cheers, my friends. Thank you so much for the ear. See you again soon. Good, we don't need to do something.